Well, what I've what I've heard from the side, and I don't agree with them, but I, I've been, I've been familiar with these individuals that are saying that when we talk about intersectionality, that it excludes the question of class, um, you know, the economic classes that we're a part of, that it doesn't really want to address the roots of of capitalism and its form in the way that it it uh, oppresses us or. Um, you know, produces alienation and all of these other effects. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they say, and it's interesting, and I kind of half agree with it to a point, which is that by not focusing on, on class, on the, uh, the materialist or economic side of it, because that, that side of it's so difficult to address because we are, because capitalism governs everything in our lives, that it's easier to control other aspects of the intersectional, forms of oppression like it's easier to address race or gender or mm-hmm. sexuality or in these other things than it is to address capitalism mm-hmm. and so i feel like sometimes a lot of this is really just um it's almost reactionary right it's like this thing isn't being emphasized enough so we're going to overemphasize it mm-hmm. and we're going to then it seems like that's kind of what's going on i don't know what your thoughts are on that yeah I, and i'm somewhat sympathetic to that because it's true that in this country and elsewhere you know, there's been a hundred year tradition um, coming from uh, business communities and academic think tanks and elsewhere, trying to drive class out of the conversation, trying to uh, frame a narrative about American society as one as like uplift and meritocracy. And, um, uh, and there's ideological work around that with, you know, for example, Koch brother founded research centers and, you know, all, all of this kind of work, but also an assault on, you know, leftist organizations and a strong component of anti-communism in the United States that has tried to disrupt mm-hmm. uh, working class organizations uh, in the U.S. So I can understand trying to bend the stick back a little bit and say like, okay, you know what, we do really need to focus on um, class, but I, I think it hurts the cause if the focus is so narrowly defined as to not really encompass what the class experience is and what it means to be working class and the tremendous variety and diversity that are found within working class peoples and working class struggles. And, um, you know, it might be easy to just emphasize the material aspects and it's certainly important and i don't think the material understanding of class is wrong i i I agree with many of of the people in the marxist tradition but it's just not quite enough and as we try especially try to build movements today um around a working class politics we need some theoretical ideas that can help reflect the true diversity and and interest of working class people today. And so hopefully this is embraced as like a, a, some constructive criticism, you know, a corrective and and not, not an attack on on people trying to do that. Yeah. Something, if you could comment on this and elaborate on this further, but you, you're, you're attempting to define, or you are defining class in this book as being, it seems to be a combination of the materialism that we see within the Marxist tradition, but it's it's combining it with cultural aspects as well. Uh, could you get into that? Sure. Well, there's a, a very strong um, tradition of cultural studies that comes out of Marxist materialism in the 20th century um, to try to think about, you know, um, really answer a basic question that came out of Marxist economics, which is if class is solely determined by Um, a relationship to the means of production, as Marx says, Um, and that relationship um, is not serving the interest of working class people and will lead to an inevitable kind of disruption or revolt um, uh, from the working class who have the interest to uh, thwart uh, capitalist exploitation. Why why haven't we seen that yet? You know, why, why hasn't there been this sort of progression towards greater and greater working class consciousness and greater working class organizations. And uh, people really at the beginning of the 20th century, like uh, Italian uh, Marxist and communist uh, Gramsci, and um, and then later in the century with British historians like 
E.P. Thompson, and then even later with uh, Jamaican-born uh, cultural studies uh, uh, theorist um, Stuart Hall, they all started to consider, well, okay, yes, material factors are important. They are a key part of defining class and class struggle. Um, the essential critique of Marx was right in that working class people are continually being exploited and have antithetical interests to uh, the rich or, or the property class. But also we need to take into account how people think about themselves, how they understand the world around them, uh, their consciousness and experiences of day-to-day -day life and class struggle, and that these are profoundly cultural questions. Um, that the worldview that people use to explain the world to themselves can contribute to class consciousness and class struggle or detract from it or emphasize certain parts um, over others. And in fact, as I was putting together the book, I think you begin to actually see this in working class people's struggles themselves. That is, as, you know, um, factory workers or homemakers um, or unemployed struggles or other things like this, as people take on political activism and start to build social movements around their issues, they be, they, they necessarily have to struggle against the intersectional nature of the reality they face. So just to take one, one short example that comes up in the book, um, at the very origins of, um, industrialization, the first industrial working class in the United States was made up of women, almost exclusively. The biggest uh, corporations at the time were textile manufacturing companies. They hired almost exclusively women to run their factories. And they did it because women were cheaper, their labor was valued less, um, but also because they were less able to resist. Women in the 19th century were not able to vote or run for office. They couldn't, um, you know, they were ridiculed if they spoke in public, like if they gave an address to a group of men or, or a mixed audience, um, they would be demonized for sort of violating their social role as being uh, confined to the domestic sphere. And so these working class women said, uh, hey, you know what, we're getting exploited on the job. We're working 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, we face dangerous conditions in which people are getting injured and, and sometimes killed in industrial accidents. And um, we can't complain about it. We can't even talk about it. We can't address these issues because we're simultaneously facing oppression um, as women in this society. And so they said, you know what, we have to critique both. We have to struggle against both. Uh, uh, one author wrote that, um, you know, that they recognized that capitalism and patriarchy were oppressing, oppressing them. And she said, we have to war with oppression in every form. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it took a while, I think, for the theorists to catch up to that experience coming from, um, coming from working class peoples. And, and, and it's, it's, it's evident in that experience that it's, you know, one part culture, uh, one part uh, material and economic exploitation. Thank you.